So far, we've been talking about all of metabolism as either being in the glucagon dominant state, that is the starvation state, poorly fed, liver doing all the work, and the insulin dominant state, that is all cells doing what they do, including the liver, taking up glucose and burning it for energy. That's okay because that's generally what happens. But let me show you the problem. And now this isn't like, oh, I have to memorize the time. This is just to show you what I'm talking about, and then we'll get into the details you have to memorize towards the end. This is a graph which is going to show the source of glucose versus time. In the insulin dominant state, the diet is rich in glucose. So all of the cells are getting their glucose from the diet. But as that meal ends abruptly, the glucose levels from the diet are going to drop precipitously. Now we know that's going to shift the pancreas from an insulin dominant state, detecting the fall of glucose, to a glucagon dominant state. And we know the liver is going to make glucose in the glucagon dominant state. So the, the liver has not been, so far, making any glucose. In fact, it's been using it. And we also know that gluconeogenesis requires some degree of induction of genes. So it's going to take a little bit of time until gluconeogenesis is able to accommodate all of the cells. So it would be convenient if there were, say, some form of gap coverage, some way of rapidly accessing glucose that the liver could give to all the cells while it ramps up gluconeogenesis. That's glycogen. In glycogen synthesis and catabolism is the subject of today's lesson. The liver, in the insulin dominant state, was taking up glucose. And it was sending out fatty acids. It was doing that so those fatty acids could be stored somewhere else, and when the liver needed them, they'd come back. This is the insulin dominant state. Also during that insulin dominant state are other cells. Cells like skeletal muscle, brain, and heart. Well, the skeletal muscle, brain, and heart are all using the glucose from the diet, just as the liver is. Taking up the glucose, burning it to ATP. When it switches over, to the glucagon dominant state, fatty acids will eventually come back into the liver, oxidized to generate the ATP, necessary to sustain the liver cell while the liver cell makes the glucose. Of course, the liver is not going to be using glucose anymore since it's making it, and of course, it makes ketone bodies. We're going to basically ignore those for now. This is in the glucagon dominant state. And once the liver is in the complete glucagon dominant state, it can supply these other cells, skeletal muscle, brain, heart. The brain and the heart are reliant on the liver to give its energy. But we need gap coverage. Something needs to provide this glucose while gluconeogenesis is upregulated. And of course, that is the glycogen stores that were made during the insulin dominant state. These provide rapid access to the cells that need it. The liver is still producing the glucose. It just isn't gluconeogenesis yet. It's glycogen. And sometimes, skeletal muscle will need more energy than the liver can keep up with. If you think about it, the skeletal muscle is just sitting there. It doesn't do anything. Right? And it doesn't require a lot of ATP to just sit there. But as soon as you want to contract your muscle, contractions require ATP, and a lot of it. The pancreas senses the whole body system, and so can't feel one arm is contracting. There's no way for the muscle in the arm to tell the pancreas or liver, hey, I need more glucose. Instead, what the skeletal muscle does is keeps rapidly accessible forms of glucose within itself so that when it needs to contract and it needs an extra ATP, the glycogen stores are right there.
So during the insulin dominant state, the liver is going to build glycogen, and so is the skeletal muscle. While the, they're switching to the glucagon dominant state, while switching, glycogen provides the glucose during the gap period. And skeletal muscle hangs on to some glycogen just in case it needs an extra boost of ATP during contractions. What I want you to see is that rapidly metabolic tissue, heart, kidneys, brain, do not have glycogen stores. There's no downtime. There's no room for them to say, oh, I've got it easy. I'm going to store some stuff. Only skeletal muscle can do that. And the liver, because the liver is going to be the source of glucose for everybody while they're transitioning to the glucagon state using glycogen, and eventually will be the source of glucose through gluconeogenesis, again in the glucagon dominant state. What does glycogen look like? Glycogen starts with a core protein. And from that core protein are going to be long strings, long chains of glucose, stacked one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. And they're going to form what's called a 1,4 glycoside bond. That is, if you look at a chain, you'll have a glucose, six carbon sugar, oriented such that the one carbon and the four carbon form the bonds. And there'll be a free end for another glucose molecule to be snapped on top. If all that happened were these chains grew out from the center core protein, the highest density of glucose would be near the core. That's inconvenient because we want to have our enzymes, our little Pac-Man, accessing the glucose at the periphery. And if we zoom in on this, what we see is in fact that there's not a whole lot of glycogen or glucose in view. That's because the chains grow out straight away from each other, so in the periphery they separate. What we want is to have the highest density of glucose at the very tips of the glycogen, so that many chains are accessible to get that glucose back. Well, the glycogen accomplishes this by not only growing the straight chains, but also branching. And the more times it branches, the denser it gets. Because the more branches there are, the more opportunities for elongation there are. So if you zoom in on this set of branched chains, what you'll see is a whole lot of glucose available at the periphery. And I want you to see that each chain can be individually accessed. Somewhere down below are going to be the branch points. But the idea is that our enzymes have the most access to the most glucose if we have branches. Okay, not so bad. Glycogen is going to be the holdover between the insulin and glucagon dominant states. Liver is still producing the glucose. And glycogen is the rapidly accessible storage form for skeletal muscles. What's the pathway look like? What's the biochemistry? Well, we know that glucose is going to get into cells. It's going to get into cells and it's going to get locked into those cells as glucose 6 phosphate. This was accomplished by GLT2 in the liver and glucokinase. GLT2 gets the glucose in, glucokinase locks it in, liver. In skeletal muscle, that was GLT4 and exokinase. Now you're probably tired of hearing about glycolysis, so I'm going to be brief. One potential route that this glucose 6-phosphate could take was glycolysis. But what if the cell's got plenty of ATP? It's energy rich. It doesn't need any more ATP. It doesn't need to go glycolysis. Well, certain tissues, skeletal muscle and liver, has the ability to instead store that glucose 6-phosphate as glycogen. The way it does that is through a reversible reaction that moves that phosphate around. It becomes glucose 1-phosphate. This was the same 
compound we encountered in galactose metabolism. It was how galactose got into glycolysis. It first becomes glucose 1-phosphate, then the glucose 6-phosphate, and into glycolysis. This was the branch point by which galactose could become glycogen or enter glycolysis. Now, glycogen is a stored form of energy to be harnessed later, so it's not going to be surprising that in order to build glycogen, we're going to have to put energy in. The first step, you don't have to know the name because it's hard and complicated and won't benefit you at all. But what it does is it charges the glucose. It charges it with a UDP, making it UDP glucose. To do that, we take a full UTP, high energy compound just like ATP, put it into the system and we lose two phosphates. This charged glucose has the UDP on it and it is attached to the glucose molecule. It attaches at a 1-4 position, forming that bond, which then makes this chain elongate by exactly one glucose. And that one glucose has another free end so that the next charged UDP glucose can come in and add to the elongating chain. We first need to charge it. That's what the UDP glucose is for. We're going to glycogen. And to do that, we're going to use a combination of glycogen synthase and branching enzyme. Not surprisingly then, to come back from glycogen, we need to undo both the branching and the elongation. So coming from glycogen back to that phosphorylated glucose is going to require phosphate, the phosphorylation step, and is performed by glycogen 